Today's guest is one of my favorite fellow coaches on the gram. Her name is Danny Hamilton. She goes by Danielle Hamilton Health on Instagram. Make sure you follow her. She is incredible if you're not following her already. Um, she's a functional and nutritional therapy practitioner and restorative wellness practitioner who specializes in blood sugar regulation and digestion. Wow. That was, sorry. <laughs> Working on my speech therapy right now. <laughs> she became interested in blood sugar issues when she learned that insulin resistance was at the root of her PCOS. She was able to reverse her PCOS, cystic acne, PMS, and weight loss resistance by reversing insulin resistance. Her mission is to help others uncover their blood sugar and insulin issues, as most people don't know the early signs, as well as help them optimize digestion for low carb diets. Danny promotes a holistic approach to reversing insulin resistance, which goes beyond just changing macros. She's the host of the Unlock the Sugar Shackles podcast, which I was on. That was so awesome to um, be on her podcast as well. And the creator of the Blood Sugar Mastery Program. <sighs> Danny's awesome. You guys are going to love this episode. Um, she is one of those people that is just like so powerful in her message because she's been through it. She's open-minded, she's educated, and she's dedicated. So um, we will go ahead and jump in. Uh, make sure you catch at the end if you want to you know, work with Danny or do her course or do a consultation with her. You can find her at daniellehamiltonhealth.com. Okay, let's go ahead and dive in. Here is Danny Hamilton. All right. So Danny, I was telling you before we started, I'm very excited to actually have a conversation about blood sugar on my podcast. I'm like, when I realized that I haven't actually had an episode on that yet, I was like, Tara. So, it, but you know what? It was because it was reserved for you because you are my favorite voice in the entire industry on the topic of blood sugar for a couple of reasons. One, you've got, you've gone through the whole thing. And two, you're very open-minded and like more information based with humanity versus this kind of like some, we get some dogmatic, uh, like good, bad, but like, you know, and you're not like that. So, um, I was wondering, you know, obviously we're going to get into the nitty gritty of blood sugar and what to look for, but just so people know that you like literally know what you're talking about, not just from an education coach perspective, but also from going through it yourself. Can you give us a little background on how you got here? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate that, Tara, because at one point I did identify myself with my diet and that's easy to do, but yeah. I really believe in bio-individuality. So we'll we'll circle back to that. So thank you for your kind words. Um, so my story starts out in childhood. I was, you know, sickly-ish kind of kid, nothing terrible, but like colds, flus, strep throat, ear infections, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And then I was, I grew up in the eighties and nineties. So mm -hmm. everything was low fat and, you know, mm -hmm. processed carbs and snack wells and uh, mm -hmm. chewy granola bars because they're low fat. And, you know, my right. mom's doing a good thing because my peanut butter and jelly sandwich is on whole wheat bread. And my brother who was, you know, thinner, he got the peanut butter fluff on the potato bread. Like, so I had the healthy oh version of that. Right. So, <laughs> you know, and everyone's just trying to do the best with the information right. they have. So my mom's like, I'm sorry. I'm like, it's not your fault, Ma. You were following the rules, right? Yeah. So we're following the rules in the eighties and nineties and we're developing all these issues. And so I ended up getting strep throat six times my senior year of high school. I got my oh. tonsils out. I developed really bad seasonal allergies the year later and looking back on that, I was like, oh, the tonsils are part of the immune system. That sort of makes sense yeah. that my whole system went haywire. So uh -huh. I got really bad allergies and asthma, and I was starting to use inhalers. Mm. And I was like, I thought that's what kids did, you know, like not, you don't develop that when you're 18 or 19. So then I moved to Miami, Florida for grad school and season for allergies became all year round. I was lucky enough to even be allergic to palm trees. I didn't even know that was a thing. And oh I felt like I needed to live in a bubble. I was allergic to so many things. I was getting those shots. So I didn't have to take all these five medications, three and inha two inhalers. It was, it was nuts. And this is my early twenties. Mm. I was getting these shots and I was allergic to so many different things. I, they had to put them in three separate shots. And then a year later, because I wasn't healing my gut and the root cause, right, right. I developed new allergies and I had two more shots. So I was going broke on these copays. And at the time I was working as a speech therapist in a nursing home. And I asked the, the doctor's office if I could get the nurse at my job to give me these shots. And she ended up teaching me how to do it. So 
all that to say that I was giving myself five allergy shots in the stomach every other day in my oh, early smokes. 20s. I was still symptomatic. I had chronic sinus infections. I was so tired. I was dealing with candida and other like recurrent infections. And mm-hmm. I had my gynecologist on speed dial. I mean, it was just Holy insane. Smoke. And that was 2012. I was like 24 at the time ish. And I was, I was working at the nursing home and I was seeing all my patients and they were in their seventies, eighties and nineties with these whole lists of diagnoses and all these medications. And I just saw this dotted line to that. Like, I'm like, this is my present. That's going to be my future if something doesn't change. And so it freaked me out. And by the grace of the universe, I got Rob Wolf's book in my hand called the paleo diet solution. And it was, it, it was divine intervention for sure, because I got that book and it just turned everything that I knew on its head. It was like, get rid of the processed food, embrace meat and fat and, and salt and all these things that were so demonized my whole life growing up. And it all just made so much sense to me. And like looking at it from that ancestral perspective and like how, you know, we were not, uh, we didn't evolve with these heavily processed foods. I'm like, that makes so much sense. So I tried it in my body and like a miracle, all my allergies were gone. I had this chronic tendonitis in my ankle that was gone. No more inhalers, threw everything out, no more sinus infections. And I was just wanting to like shout it from the rooftops. I'm like, oh my gosh, food can heal. This is amazing. And so I was just riding high on that paleo train, right? So um, (laughs) I had, then I had a move and a really stressful year and all these things were happening. And I started to develop what I guess were a lot of hormonal symptoms. And I was like, wow, like I was just doing really well. And now I'm sleeping until 11 AM. And normally I'm like up like the sun, like a rooster. I'm, I missed my period for six months. I started gaining weight. I had, I had always had some acne. It was terrible. Like it was on my cheeks and on my forehead. I mean, every, it wasn't just like a couple of pimples with my cycle. Um, my PMS was horrible, like off the chain. My, I had so much breast tenderness. I had PMDD. I was breaking up with whoever I was dating the week before my period. Like it was just like, (laughs) what is happening? Because this diet that just made me so healthy and, and healed me, all of a sudden I'm getting sick. And I knew the answer wasn't to go back to what I had been doing. I knew that, but I didn't have any other answers. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll just paleo harder. (laughs) So I just tried to do it harder. And obviously since nothing changed, nothing changed. So I had to look up online uh, and I looked up my symptoms and I was like, it looks like I have PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, Mm -hmm. based on all these symptoms. I didn't have the hair growth on the face or the hair loss from the head, luckily, but I had all the other symptoms. And so I was looking at the advice for PCOS. It was like, get rid of gluten, dairy, and refined sugar. I was like, check, check, check. I'm doing paleo. I I do that. Mm -hmm. So again, it was just reinforcing, just do what you're doing, just do it harder, do it stricter. I I don't know. So (laughs) of course nothing was changing. And my mom's like, why don't you just go to a doctor, get some medication. You're not a failure if that happens. And I was like, Mm. you know, you're right. I'm just gonna, maybe the doctor has some answers. Right. So I go to the doctor and I said, listen, I'm eating really healthy. I'm working out. I can't lose weight. And I think I have PCOS and I really want some help to, to get rid of it. He goes, you do have PCOS. You have to lose weight. There's no cure. You have to take the pill. It's like, whoa, thank you for that. (laughs) Like, Did I just pay for that advice? Like, is it like, what just happened? So he forced me to walk out with a script for the pill. I ripped it up in my car. Thank you. (laughs) And, and I mean, he was like fighting me on not wanting to take it. And I had had horrible reaction to the pill in the past. I mean, like my breast doubles in size, I would wake up at night because there was so much pain. I got horrendous acne. I gained so much weight on the pill. I'm like, this doesn't seem like something that's going to help. I had morning sickness on the pill and I got a breast lump that I had to remove at 20 years old. So no, I was not going to take the pill. And here is this medical professional who's supposed to know stuff, literally force figuratively forcing this script down my throat. Mm -hmm. And it was just unbelievable. So 
long story, all to say that that motivated me more than ever to fix this myself. So mm. time goes on. I'm digging into everything that I could get my hands on, listening to every podcast, reading every book, every blog, blogs were big back then. And I'm going like just learning so much information. So I knew so much about health. Mm -hmm. And one day I hear this podcast, it was Megan Ramos on Dr. Fung's podcast. And she said, PCOS is the diabetes of the ovaries. And I just like almost drove my car off the road. I was like, what do you mean diabetes? Oh my goodness. I actually skipped over all the the chapters on blood sugar because I thought it didn't pertain to me. I thought it was like, who cares about this? This is like, I'm like, I don't have diabetes. I don't have to care about that. So I didn't know that type two diabetes is this spectrum, right? So we can have blood sugar dysregulation years and decades before it manifests into type two diabetes. I would hear blood sugar and I would blaze over because that was complicated and boring and who wanted to even learn about that. And meanwhile, what I was resisting was, was really at the root of all these things. Mm -hmm. So I look back and say, okay, there, I have to have symptoms of blood sugar issues. I just don't know what they are because I don't know what blood sugar symptoms look like. And maybe I was the only one, but maybe not because the only symptom I knew about type two diabetes was something about amputations, something about blood sugar because of the patients that I worked with when I was a speech therapist. So not knowing anything about that, I was like, okay, I, I dove into the, you know, all I went back, I, I read all the chapters of the books that I had skipped. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is me. So awesome. I thought that a lot of blood sugar issues that I have had, uh, I thought were personality traits. So I thought I was just the hangry friend. Right. I thought I was a foodie and that's why I needed to carry food with me. And that's why I used to eat before I went out to eat. It wasn't because I was a foodie. I used to hate to be, hun- I just hate being hungry. Hate being hungry because it was a blood sugar crash because your body was going through a crisis. So all these things, I thought I was a breakfast person. I wasn't a breakfast person. I just like to eat breakfast because I'd wake up shaking and hypoglycemic. (laughs) So I thought these were all personality traits. And I was, and I mean, a, a sweet tooth. Like I used to say, my line was, I don't have a sweet tooth. All my teeth are sweet. That was my motto, you know? And I didn't know that that was blood sugar dysregulation. So how it showed up in me was I had low blood sugar, but I had high insulin. My insulin was pushing down my blood sugar too low. So I used to have to eat all the time Mm -hmm. to keep my blood sugar up because Mm -hmm. the, like I said, that the feeling of the hunger in my body was really low blood sugar. And we can go into that, but how it showed up for me was that dizziness, shakiness, anxiety, irritability, sort of like this, your head feels like a balloon, um, brain fog, difficulty concentrating. And then a lot of people get other symptoms. And usually these show up when you're hungry or when a meal is like delayed. So let's say you have a meeting and it's going through your lunchtime. It's like, you can't concentrate. You start maybe heart palpitations, headaches, cravings, intense, urgent hunger, um, Mm -hmm. feeling, uh, getting sweaty, um, clammy. Um, some people get, they get cold. I mean, there's all sorts of symptoms, but you should not be basically the take home message is that your hunger should feel like, Oh, I could eat like, Oh, Oh yeah. I'm pretty hungry, but you shouldn't feel different. You shouldn't feel like you, you honestly should be able to feel like you could still be on a podcast and talk and, and problem solve and finish that work meeting and not change your mood. I mean, if your mood changes when you're hungry, if you turn into Joe Pesci in the Snickers commercial, Mm -hmm. you're probably your blood sugar is dysregulated. Right. So Mm -hmm. that's how I learned about all that and where I fit in. And those are just the early signs. So I'll let you jump in because that's a lot. Mm, (laughs) So good. Like, okay. So, I mean, the, the, that's such a like mic drop about, I thought they were personality traits. Oh my gosh. So many people can relate to that. Cause how many, like how many memes do we see about hanger? Uh, like don't mess with me. I'm hangry. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, And shirts and everything. And it's just like this thing. And it, you're right. Like 
it's, I don't think people were, it's like, you're not just like, it's not some genetic, like you're hangry, you know, it's, it's like, like oh, I'm the hangry friend. Oh, we need to get Jessica something to eat because like, God forbid, you know, we can all picture those people. And right. unfortunately that's the people with that, that, that crisis happening in their body. Right. And I used to be like that too, like back when I was overweight and, you know, I like that all of to, to think that, to hear you say what you just said for me back then, when you said that, uh, you, you you shouldn't feel different in your mood or energy levels, I would have kind of probably not believed you. Like, that's how real that was for me. I was like, yeah, no, she's just saying that. Like, I would have been like, everybody feels kind of whack when they're hungry. Everybody feels kind of like in a bad mood when they're hungry. That's how, how, uh, like, it would have been hard for me to believe. And now, especially after doing keto and intermittent fasting and eating healthy, like, no, if you, I'm just saying, if you're listening to this and you were wondering if she's like exaggerating or if that's not really a real thing, it is a real thing. And both of us have lived on both sides of that. And now it is, it's, it's a physiological hunger, just like in my belly. It's not like I can't operate. I can't like communicate. I'm not like sitting there. The The last thing I'll add on from my perspective is just, it's when you're like kind of obsessed with food. Like, it's just like, when is this freaking going to be over so I can eat? Ugh, it's like this urgent, like just everybody shut up, <laughs> make the meeting. And now like that, that goes away. It really yeah. does. So I just wanted to back that one up. Okay. Thank you for go. sharing that. I wanted to share one more thing because yeah. I, like you, I wouldn't have believed myself either because what my reaction I used to hear people say like, oh my God, I think I forgot to eat lunch. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> like I have never missed a meal in my right. life. Like how could you forget to eat lunch? Like right. I thought, I thought they were showing off or lying right. for sure. A hundred percent. So I totally relate to that idea that like, there's no way. And no I way. didn't, no. and, and you just don't think that you could be different because your experience has never been different. Right. I, I was always that breakfast person because I'd wake up and eat special K and count chocula and golden right. grams. And like, right. you know, like I'd eat right. cereal and then have the spike and that like, right. I mean, I didn't have a gram of fat in my body. And I maybe only had a, a chicken breast and maybe like two eggs. Right. That was Same. the only protein I was getting from um, my whole childhood. So uh, like, what was I running on? I was running on sugar forever. Yeah, right. And like, that, I mean, obviously that's what we were told, but that's the result. You know, that was the result for me. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's hit on this. Um, your, your blood sugar being low, this being an early warning sign insulin is kind of driving it too low. So I want to hit on that. I guess like, you know, you talk about this type two diabetes spectrum. Could you mm -hmm. maybe take us through the, the path of yeah. what you might be experiencing as you get, you know, where the first early warning signs all the way to like, okay, now it's starting to get bad. You got it. So let's start with talking about like, what does blood sugar really mean? Because that was where I like glazed over. And so just <laughs> hang in with me. I'm going to make it as simple as possible and as quick as and painless as possible. So sugar is an energy source. And when we eat something, especially with carbohydrates, our liver actually puts more sugar into our blood and then, or that the carbohydrates digest and it increases the amount of this glucose or sugar in our blood. Our pancreas, just a little organ will sense this and be like, oh, blood sugar is going up. I like the blood sugar in this Goldilocks range. The pancreas doesn't like it too high. It doesn't like it too low. It likes it to be just right. And so it's going to secrete this hormone called insulin, which one of the things it does is it takes glucose basically by the hand. It shuttles it into the cells of the body. So it'll knock on the door like, hey, muscle cell, I have some glucose for you. And then the cell will be like, all right, come on in. So the insulin is what does the job of like helping to escort glucose into the cells for the most part. Um, sometimes they could go in by itself, but mostly it needs insulin to do this. So insulin will start putting the glucose into the brain cells, into the muscle cells, liver cells, heart cells, all where it needs to go. And then fat cells. So that's how the amount of sugar, that's how insulin lowers sugar in the blood because it's putting it into the body. So it's not going anywhere. It's just moving locations, right? So that's how our blood sugar goes down. And like I said about that Goldilocks thing, our body likes to have a little bit of sugar, just about a teaspoon floating around at all times for quick access to quick energy. 
And so we have other access to energy in our body. Like I like to look at our liver, like the refrigerator. So that stores glycogen or another form of sugar. And so that's also easy access. So when we use up the sugar in the blood, we should be able to just go into the fridge and grab some sugar from the liver and be like, oh, no problem. Like overnight, Mm -hmm. you, you run out of sugar from your meal. Let's just dip into the liver glycogen. No problem. Or muscle glycogen. No problem. And then the body fat is stored energy. That's like the deep freeze though, right? So it takes a little bit more um, energy to get that, but that's that should also not be a problem because I could go down my stairs, open up the freezer and get into the deep freeze, right? Mm-hmm. So this is what we want the body to be. This is like the body's reserves. It has this energy because think about our ancestors. If you know the buffalo came, we didn't kill it looks like we're eating body fat for dinner, right? So we should be able, like we're set up as humans to be able to go through food scarcity. So the fact that we would have to eat every three hours doesn't necessarily make sense with our physiology, right? Right. Because we're set up to be able to not have to do that. So if we are having to do that, it makes you question like, okay, why do I have to eat so often then? What's happening? So oftentimes what happens is there's this metabolic dysfunction that starts happening. And usually once we, when we spike our blood sugar a lot, we get a lot of insulin. And so we have these huge spikes of blood sugar, usually from, you know, refined carbohydrates and this crap food that they have everywhere that they sell everywhere and they push in our faces. And so we're getting these blood sugar spikes all the time. We're getting these big surges of insulin and insulin takes longer to come down than blood sugar does. Blood sugar comes down right away, but the insulin sort of hangs out a little bit longer. And so we get this sort of buildup of insulin levels over time. We need more and more insulin to do the same job. And we start to develop resistance to this insulin. So that's like, you know, the insulin's knocking on the door of the cell being like, Hey, have some glucose for you. It's like the boy who cried wolf. It's like, you were just here, you know, like I've had enough of you today. So the cells are like, la la la, I'm not listening. Like I've heard this message before, you know, so we need more and more and more insulin to do the same job. And so as the insulin starts building up in our body, the insulin is sending, it's a hormone. So hormones send messages. And so this insulin is sending a strong message to the body to store fat. And when we're in, to simplify it, when we're in a fat storage mode, we can't be in a fat burning mode. So the high insulin levels in our body are blocking our body from accessing the refrigerator, the liver glycogen, and from accessing stored body fat. So if you have stored body fat, but no energy, it's an access problem. You can't access the energy that you have. And Mm -hmm. that leads you to be dependent on this steady stream of carbohydrates coming in through your diet. So that's why you have to eat every few hours because that's the only energy your body is perceiving. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of feel you're like, I can't go low carb. I can't cut out meals. That sounds like horrible. I could (laughs) never do that. I could never miss a meal because your body is inefficient at accessing the energy that it has. Right. So And some of this, you know, of course I'm learning about mitochondria and I'm sure a lot of this is also mitochondrial dysfunction, but I'm not going to go into that today, but there's so many layers to this, but let's just simplify it. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first signs of blood sugar dysregulation are really when we get those spikes. Mm -hmm. And so you can feel the same symptoms at a spike as you do at a low. And that was Mm -hmm. something interesting to me. So, you know, companies will send you and me like food and things like that Mm -hmm. to try. And so I got this paleo cereal and I used to love cereal. If you notice, I name dropped a couple of cereals back there. (laughs) Um, That was like my thing. So I was like, oh my gosh, a paleo cereal, maybe I can try this. So I made sure I had um, some fat and protein and I had steak and green beans. I had this before I had the cereal and I had the serving size three quarters cups of this cereal (laughs) and my blood sugar spiked higher than I've ever seen it. It spiked to 168 and I was laying in my bed. I was so exhausted. And I was like, at the peak of that spike, I was like, this voice came in my head and was like, go get more cereal. Do we have ice cream? Maybe you should go buy chocolate. And I was like, oh my God, my sugar dragon who got woken up and just started screaming in my ear. I had to power walk for 30 minutes to get it back down. But like, it's incredible that you could get these cravings when you're at the peak of a spike that totally like flipped this on my head because I thought it was only really 
when you're mm-hmm. coming down fast, like your blood mm-hmm. sugar is dropping quickly or you're at this low, mm-hmm. but you can have this anywhere. So I have other clients who are saying, oh, I get these headaches after my lunch. And I it's when it's at the peak of the spike. Mm-hmm. So we can start to be getting mm-hmm. symptoms anywhere really when our blood sugar is not in that happy range. Mm-hmm. So, but oftentimes the symptoms show up the most dramatic when there's the sharpest peaks and in changes. So right. um, I always say I like rolling hills on like a continuous right. glucose monitor as opposed to these steep mountain peaks. So that feels better in our body. So these quick changes feel awful and then make our body go into this like stress state and how much of this is really this cortisol or stress hormones also contributing to those feelings. Mm, okay. So, really super quick yeah. interjection, glu- continuous glucose monitor. If someone's never heard of that and they're listening to this, what is that? A continuous glucose monitor is this little thing that you put on like the back of your arm and it tests your blood sugar in real time. And it's the most powerful, amazing tool. I think that you could use to understand your health and start connecting your symptoms Mm -hmm. to your blood sugar. That's Mm -hmm. what we want to do. We want to look at the patterns on the glucose monitor, sometimes look at the numbers and be like, what is happening for me in my body when I experience this? So I have a meal and after that meal, I'm always having headaches and I'm, and I'm cranky. And then I need a coffee. And then I'm yep. feeling like I can't pay attention in my afternoon. Yeah. Well, start to see what's happening on the glucose monitor. What you'll probably find is that your blood sugar spiked and then it's going down and then maybe it's correcting, maybe it's spiking again. It, you know, there's all mm-hmm. these different possible patterns of what's happening, but it gives you this access to see inside your physiology and Mm -hmm. to be able to modify in real time. So because I had that glucose monitor on and I saw it spike instead of getting that second bowl of cereal, which I totally would have done hundred percent, uh, because that voice was loud. Um, I went for a walk and I kept checking my, my CGM and I'm like, Oh, it's not down yet. So I kept walking, kept walking until I got it back down to normal. And I was like, Oh, I actually feel good. So I utilized Mm -hmm. that sugar that I put in the system and I felt fine. If I didn't do that, it would have kept spiking and then it would have crashed really hard. And then I probably would have fallen asleep for sure (laughs) because you just pass out from all that insulin. Wow. Thank you. I, 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 if any of my more biohacky people, maybe you've worn an aura ring or a whoop strap and you're into HRV, if you have it, if you've done that, and you haven't done a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. Like, um, I mean, HRV is cool and I support that and stuff, but like, man, I think the CGM is one of the coolest tools that we have to actually learn about what's going on in your own physiology. Like I could see my blood sugar go up from getting nervous or like when I was running at different speeds, how much glycogen was getting dumped out in my bloodstream. I'm like, holy crap, my blood sugar is like 150 right now. Like, holy crap, I'm like busting it, you know? And then, okay, if I go this speed, if I walk uphill on the treadmill, how much comes out, you know, like- Mm -hmm. So it is such a cool tool or, you know, wow, when I'm stressed and sleep deprived, I don't respond well to those foods, but when I sleep enough, I'm good. Wow. Good to know, you know? So anyway, exactly. Yeah, no, (laughs) no. So good to hear. Exactly. And, or like, if I have this, you know, higher carb meal at night after a day of work, my blood sugar stays elevated all freaking night long versus I have that same meal after that hard workout and my blood sugar right. doesn't move. Right. So it's learning it's, and this is where that, like not being dogmatic about things comes <laughs> yeah, in because right. we're learning about, Oh, different times of my cycle affects my blood sugar right. differently. And like, after right. I do a workout, if I'm not like, I was pretty sedentary for a couple of weeks. Cause I was sick and like, I was not having, I was not diving into carbs because I knew that I didn't have the, I didn't make the space for that in my muscles, you know, like I wasn't mm-hmm. utilizing that much energy. Mm-hmm. So right. it's about tailoring things to yourself. It's not, I'm going on a walk to punish myself. I'm going on a walk to balance out my physiology. So right. it just, makes to me, it just makes Mm -hmm. sense. So those are the early signs. And then as we keep spiking our blood sugar, as we keep inflaming ourselves through, you know, living a standard, you know, standard American way, standard American diet, seed oils, all of these things, um, we, and are living inside under blue light, we start to have more and more dysfunction and what basically happens. And this is why blood sugar, I feel like is hard to nail down is because 
every cell in the body has receptors for blood sugar and insulin or uses it, you know, can use glucose and has receptors for insulin. Mm -hmm. And so the symptoms of blood sugar dysregulation, it can impact every single cell organ Mm -hmm. and process in the Mm -hmm. body. So it's not like, Oh, I'm coughing. I have a lung problem. Like that's pretty obvious, right? Like it's not like, Oh, my vision is blurry. I need to check my eyes. Like it's not so straightforward. And so that's why these symptoms can feel so random. So, um, basically our blood sugar affects every, like I said, cell organ and process in the body. And you could go head to toe and look at long-term effects of having dysregulated blood sugar and insulin resistance. So starting in the brain, it starts out with like, you know, maybe some brain fog, some mood issues. And then as it progresses, it turns into memory loss, type three diabetes is Alzheimer's. Um, It turns into like, now I have a prescription for mood, you know, pills for, for depression and anxiety and um, you know, eyes, macular degeneration is highest in type two diabetics our teeth, we know that our teeth and our gums are affected by sugar and, um, you know, inflammation, anything with itis. So like gingivitis, it can Mm -hmm. drive these types of things Poor balance of the bacteria in the mouth, in the gut, um, heart disease, Mm -hmm. insulin resistance, number one cause of high blood pressure. And then we get, of course, a lot of people with diabetes don't die of diabetes itself, but they die of cardiovascular issues like stroke and, Mm -hmm. and heart attacks and things like that. And then we go further and we go into the stomach and the gut and it can impact the levels of bacteria overgrowth of yeast. It impacts our liver. We get fatty liver. We have difficulty, um, even stabilizing our blood sugar. So some people, their blood sugar keeps going low. Um, that affects the adrenals as well. Every time we have a blood sugar spike or a low, if we have that low, um, a lot of times people wake up with like a pounding heart. It's because their glycogen was tanked and they can't tap into stored body fat and their adrenals need to come in and pump them with stress hormones in an emergency basically. And so to create new sugar. And so a lot of people wake up in the middle of the night with this pounding heart and they think, Oh, I'm having a panic attack. It's like, no, you're having a blood sugar crash actually. And it's a, it's very, very common. And so the adrenals get really um, sort of depleted. It affects all our hormone balance. Of course, our um, reproductive organs for me, the way that insulin, high insulin was manifesting in me was it raised my androgen levels. So in women, it raises androgen levels. So your testosterone, your DHEA, and it can lead to PCOS and it's the highest cause of infertility. And then in men, it can actually raise estrogen levels. And, you know, all the way down to the toes, amputations. I mean, we, the list goes on, just pick an organ, Mm -hmm. skin Mm -hmm. issues. It was causing my acne. I mean, Mm -hmm. just so many things, our energy levels, our mood, Mm -hmm. our, our sleep wake cycle, um, you know, sleeping, it it really blood sugar impacts our sleep and then sleep impacts our blood sugar. So Mm -hmm. it's just, you could go on and on and then you start to see the numbers show up at the doctor. That's when they start picking it up. Like, Oh, finally your fasting blood sugar went over a hundred. Now they're just going to tell you to watch what you eat. Like, what does that do? Um, (laughs) just eat less and exercise more. Okay. That's, you know, that's been really successful. And then once it gets over 126, that's when they can give you metformin or, you know, some other blood sugar lowering drug, but it's like, that's when they start to pay attention, your cholesterol levels going up. That's a huge sign of blood sugar dysregulation, especially like triglycerides and low HDL. Mm -hmm. And so we start to see all this dysfunction. And one of the things that I thought was really just, it blew my mind was that metabolic syndrome. I think we've all probably heard of metabolic syndrome, but maybe we don't fully know what it is. I had to look it up. I was like, what is metabolic syndrome? Like does it mean that you, you have obesity? Like, I didn't really know what it was. And it's all these markers like high blood pressure, um, high blood sugar, um, weight, high waist circumference, high cholesterol, that kind of thing. And what it used to be called, it used to be called insulin resistance syndrome. Like, really? why did we take that name away? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like 93% of people are metabolically unhealthy. They fit somewhere into this spectrum. And it's like, it just keeps progressing yet. The doctors are catching it when it's at the last stage. Yeah. Like to yeah. me, and I know you too, it's like 120 over 126. I'm like, 
holy, that is way, way too far to start intervening. Like pretty much as soon as if it's over a hundred, when you wake up, like you got some freaking work to do and you like, it's just like basic self-love. Like if you don't want to end up (laughs) obese, tired, sick, dementia, strokes, heart attack. I mean, it's like 126 is like horrifying to me that that's when people are first getting like the true message. You know, they they could be like 120 and the doctor's like, okay, just, you know, it's getting a little higher. Make sure you eat well, which they're not going to change anything. Like to me, if I saw 120, I'd be like, holy, okay. On a client, I'd be like, nothing else mattered. Like only this matter, (laughs) you know, like that's like red alarm level to me. So the doctors though, Tara, they're like, oh, my doctor wasn't really concerned about it, but I'm having so many symptoms that you post about online. I'm like, Mm -hmm. yes, this is the problem. So, so many people are getting, experiencing gaslighting from their doctor. And especially because they'll get an A1C, let's say people are having highs and lows, right? Their Mm -hmm. blood sugar's peaking high, mm, it's dropping low, right. they're on this blood sugar roller coaster. A1C is an average of your blood sugar over the past three months. What mm. do we know about averages? Highs and lows, mm. guess who has a perfect freaking average? Oh. So you're so you're averaging okay. Great point. And maybe you were right. you know fasting a little bit when you got your fasting blood work. So you maybe had to walk far, you know, right. to get to the doctor's office. That's not what your fasting blood sugar is. Like you, yeah. you know, maybe it's more like when you wake up. You know, not like two, you, when your appointment is at like nine o'clock, it's more like, right. So the, what are the numbers Mm -hmm. actually in the the doctor's office that they're testing? Mm -hmm. This is why CGMs to go back Mm -hmm. to that, these glucose Mm -hmm. monitors are just the best thing that you can get for your own, to take your health into your own hands, because you're, you might show up to your doctor and your blood sugar is 98 where they're Um, not going to bat an eye. Not at all. They won't even mention it. They're going to be like, Oh, that's perfect. Like (laughs) she is in, she is in perfect health. And then your A1C might be like 5.6 and the cutoff for diabetes, uh, pre-diabetes is 5.7. And they're probably like, Oh, this is fine. You know, this is totally an average person I see who's not totally sick. And, and they're not going to say anything to you. And meanwhile, you can't sleep, you're craving yeah. food, you can't pay attention, you can't miss a meal, you're constantly right. eating sugar, like, like, you're symptomatic. And so <laughs> this is why, like, this is what I'm so passionate about. And I'm thank you so much for having me on to talk about this, mm-hmm. because this is the information that I needed, because I, mm-hmm. I caught it like really late, and I was able to reverse it. And that's the good news. That's the good news. Yeah. Like, even if you have type two diabetes, we can progress backwards on this spectrum, but the further along you are, the harder it is, right? The longer right. amount of time it takes right. and the more damage that you have, because these blood sugar spikes mm-hmm. are creating inflammatory right like cascades in Mm -hmm. our body. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to mitigate this as soon as we can. So it's not to say if you have, if your blood sugar, if you're like, God, I would pray for my blood sugar to be 126 because it's higher than that. Like you're not too far gone. You aren't. Mm -hmm. And like, Mm -hmm. don't let anyone tell you that you are, Mm -hmm. but you need to work and you Mm -hmm. need to make changes if you, because no one is coming to save you and there's no pill that's Mm going to fix this. So Mm -hmm. that's the thing with blood sugar. Like I, I do, you know, I help my clients with a lot of supplements, but most of the supplements that I give them are geared toward helping them digest Mm -hmm. all this protein and fat that they're going to eat and, and heal their gut and reduce Mm -hmm. some inflammation in there, but not so much blood sugar wise. Yeah. Maybe they need some, you know, B vitamins and things like that. But for the most part, this has to be diet and lifestyle to mm-hmm. take care of it. There's not, you can't out supplement your mm-hmm. way out of this and mm-hmm. things like that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, so like we kind of paused on your story of when you realized your blood sugar was, you know, PCOS and this was an issue. So what happened next in your story when you found yeah. this out? So what I did was I took my paleo plate, which was all real food. I realized that I had been going ham on the paleo carbs because mm-hmm. I thought, these are healthy carbs. This is healthy sugar. Like this comes from nature. I didn't think, I thought just like how we thought we could eat unlimited snack wells in the nineties and we didn't have to pay attention to it. I thought the same thing. I didn't have to pay attention to this at all. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, and I I took this inventory. I was like, okay, fruit smoothie for breakfast, uh, banana blended into my iced coffee with coconut sugar, acai bowls, a whole wow. sweet potato with dinner, uh, wow. you know, 
honey and maple syrup and recipes, right. um, paleo treats, Lara bars. I mean, you name it, it whole plantains, plantain chips, I, kombucha from the store, which is super high in sugar. Yeah. I mean, all of that stuff that I named is none of it is refined sugar, but it's just an assault on that's my system. Lot. Yeah. That does <laughs> not do that. Well, yeah, that's yeah. a lot of carbs. Yeah. That's, and especially for me that like, that's, I don't do that well with carbs, right? We have to also take into account these totally. individual differences. Totally. If I worked out as hard as you, I could definitely add more carbs, right? But I don't at the moment. So that also matters. Yeah. So, so I took my plate of carbs, let my plate of food, let's say I had some meat, some veg, maybe some healthy fats and a, like a starch, a carb on that plate. I just replaced the carbohydrate. I took that off and just replaced it with more fat. And that's how I got to ketosis. It was really sort of easy. And so I just went into a state of ketosis and um, I actually started with a three day fast. Do not recommend, especially if you're high, high Oh my gosh. I'm going to like go hard and try <laughs> yeah. everything. Like, yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> don't do it. Okay. If you feel tempted, I'm just going to tell you, I felt like I was moving through mud because I, I had no electrolytes. No, uh, I don't even, I don't do, do them now. now that I <laughs> yeah. I was just like, you know, you could, you hear all these things and you hear, hear all these stories. So I just want to say, pump the brakes. Let's do this in a healthy way. Um, and in a, you know, our bodies don't like that extreme change. So work, if you're eating like tons of carbs, you want to work your way down before you jump into ketosis, you know, uh, there's no rush. So, um, I went into ketosis, did some fasting. I didn't do a lot of three day fasts. Um, but I did some intermittent fasting where I would push my dinner up. I just want to say intermittent fasting does not equal skipping breakfast. Cause a lot of people think that that's what it is. It's not necessarily what it is. It can be, but, um, yeah, I did a, I like some skip dinner fast. I worked on my digestion. I worked on stress management. I made sure to dial in my sleep. Mm -hmm. And it was really amazing that I just like weight fell off. I got back to my, like a healthy weight, my skin stopped breaking out, but it did take about five months to finally see any changes in my menstrual cycle. I was like Mm -hmm. looking on blogs and, and, forums, like how long does it take to get rid of your PCOS when you have, when you, um, when you go keto and finally, after about five months, I started to notice like my periods became painless. I didn't have breast tenderness. I didn't break out with them. I didn't have mood changes. I didn't have cramps. I mean, it was just like, finally this like, and I didn't know that could happen. I didn't know that periods could be painless. I was like, Mm wait, I thought that they came with, you know, the pain and the pints of Ben and Jerry's. Like I thought that just went together, you know, yeah. and it, it doesn't have to, like, you don't have to have these insane cravings. Yes. Your basal metabolic rate goes up the week before your period. You naturally may be gravitating towards more carbs because that actually helps your hormones and that's okay. Right. But it wasn't like, give me all the carbs. Like you turn into, the, we all know the that person, right. Or like, um, when they're struggling with these hormone imbalances and have, uh, you know, PMS stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, um, my periods are regular. I have no more symptoms of PCOS. So I say I healed it because I don't have the symptoms on blood tests, my testosterone, it was actually low the last time. And so (laughs) it's like my, uh, my hormone expert friend was like, are you serious? You used to have PCOS. She's like, are you sure you had, I was like, I swear I did a lot of work. I reversed it. So, um, yeah. And then the cool part is, and this is the part where, um, I know that we, we like to talk about is that I didn't stay there. I didn't have to stay in ketosis. I did. I do think I did it a little bit too long actually, but I really struggled with a lot of sugar cravings. So I had to be very strict. And every time I did a carb up that sugar dragon would wake up and start telling me what to do. And like, I would have one raspberry and it would be like, go to the store and buy all the ice cream. It's like, come on. So it was hard for me to do carb ups, uh, Mm -hmm. because I struggled with cravings. That was one of my biggest symptoms that took the longest to go away. But, um, it was after my wedding and I was, I was just like, I really feel like if I just had a piece of fruit, like it doesn't have to be a chocolate, like it doesn't have to be ice cream, just a piece of fruit. I would feel better. And, and I started listening to that voice because it wasn't the sugar dragon. It was a different voice. Mm -hmm. And so I listened to that voice. I actually got a CGM at that time. And I started adding back in some carbs and 
I had on the CGM, I was pretty horrified with what was showing up because you lose that first phase insulin response when Mm -hmm. you are keto for a while. So you have a worse (laughs) tolerance to carbs for a little while. And I was just like, oh my gosh, good thing I was keto because this isn't good. But I learned later, it got Mm -hmm. better over time. Mm -hmm. And so- Do you remember how long that was? Because I know like uh, the study they did with rats, it was about two weeks, but I'm curious on an actual person. Do you remember? It was longer. It was longer. I think it was about a month that way. Cool. I was just like, oh, my blood sugar doesn't spike as high or stay up as long. Like yeah. it just, it wouldn't come down. And I was like, oh, okay, this is taking a long. So I'm like walking and you just see like my blood sugar would go up and there was a little dip from where I walked and then it would keep going up. I was like, no, oh, <laughs> like I had to wow. walk a lot, like do a lot more exercise for that. So, but anyway, Let's, like, let me just clarify that real sure. quick. Cause we kind of breeze past that. If people don't have context is like after you're coming off of a ketogenic diet, you can have a high blood sugar response to carbohydrates because your body is not used to having to crank out insulin that way. Right. So yeah, like so that your, is a your trap pancreas, for a lot of people. Yeah, go ahead. You can mm, explain, but so yeah. what happens? So your pancreas, when you're keto for a long time, it's like, it always has a little bit of, it should usually has a little bit of insulin sitting around for like, let's say, it's like, oh, she's eating again. Let's put out this insulin. And then now I'm going to go make more. So it had some like ready to go, Mm -hmm. so to speak. And so that's your first phase insulin response. But when you're in ketosis for so long, Mm -hmm. your pancreas is like, geez, she's never using this freaking insulin Mm -hmm. because you're not spiking your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So it's very efficient. And it's like, let's redistribute this insulin to do this and to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's not used to making Mm -hmm. that first phase insulin so when you eat carbohydrates coming off of keto, your blood sugar is going up yep. and your pancreas is like, oh my gosh, we have to make insulin. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And, right. But it doesn't have anything. So in the meantime, right. there's none of that first phase. Right. So it, the blood sugar keeps ticking up and up and up until it finally makes that insulin and you get the second phase insulin response. So that's why you were saying it's sort of like a trap where it's like, well, I yes. can't come off ketosis right. because my blood sugar goes too high. Mm-hmm. So right? it's like, yeah, if you've been keto for an extended amount of time, because when I was keto, I remember like every once in a while, I'd be like, I would have like cupcakes or something, right? Like I've been like purely in ketosis for like months, you know, like, or very, very close, very, you know, and then four sugar cupcakes, you know, and that would be like, I would literally fall asleep, literally mm-hmm. fall asleep, like, <laughs> like in yeah. diabetic, you yeah. know, and, um, not that none of that happens. And I, I just, thank you for highlighting that with us because that I see like people say, well, my body hates carbs. Or you said your sugar addict thing mm-hmm. was coming out for a while. Right. And like taking time with it. But I think sometimes we get stuck in these, uh, like one thing happens, like you eat some cookies and you feel like horrible and you been and you don't understand what's going on inside of you. I'm just saying, maybe give it a little bit of time. And I love that you said, um, it was a different kind of voice that was like, maybe I could use some fruit, not like this, like I call it the ghrelin monster. It like yes. sounds like a gremlin even like, which is yeah. perfect. So like, I know what ghrelin feels like. Thank you. Cannabis. That kind of taught me what ghrelin feels like. It's like this, like little gremlin in your head. That's like eat now, you know, or when I did my bikini competition, I was starving. That's what it's like this, like you must eat the hunger hormone. And there's a different, I know exactly what you're talking about in that other voice, because that's what it was like this intuitive, like, dude, I know that if I could just have like some freaking strawberries right now, yeah. I would be good. But instead yeah. I'm like going into the nut butters and like 5 yes. billion cashews and it's just like, <laughs> so it was like a yeah. different, more intuitive voice. So <laughs> I yeah, know for mean. sure. For sure. And yeah. So I, okay. I agree with you with that, that people are doing keto too long, but Okay. What I wanted to say, some people need to do it for longer. That's the yeah. other side. Some people need to do it for longer, for sure. Yes. I think that we need to look at keto as this tool, like how mm-hmm. long do we need it? Yes. And you talked on my podcast about the signs that you don't like that you need to come out of ketosis. So I won't right. go into that, but, um, I think that also it's important to talk about like what would help someone be able to better tolerate carbohydrates. Mm. And I really think that it comes down to, first off, we have to look at the time in our menstrual cycle. So if you're a cycling woman, the first two weeks of your cycle, right before ovulation, like that's the time where you really don't need that many carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So you can get away with doing Mm -hmm. lower carb and then on ovulation on around that day, you would potentially do better to have some carbohydrates. And so Mm -hmm. no matter what your blood sugar is doing, like we can use Mm -hmm. strategies to help Mm -hmm. it not spike. We can talk about that, 
but um, the body probably wants carbs that day. And then we might get maybe a half a week or a week after that. But then that luteal phase, like at the end, right before our cycle, Mm -hmm. our body does want carbohydrates. So Mm -hmm. some strategies to like mitigate these blood sugar spikes is one of them I talked about earlier with the cereal is eating your lots of protein, fat, protein, fat, fiber first, and then having carbs after, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure you would say like, don't go have too much fat if you're doing carbs. And, um, and then we don't want to have carbs by themselves typically for blood sugar reasons. So not having these naked carbs, which would be Mm -hmm. just, some people are like, Oh, an apple is a good snack. It's like, well, it's better than apple juice because it has a little bit of fiber. So we have to (laughs) look also at the types of carbs. So any carb that's been processed, it's going to spike your blood sugar more than the unprocessed version. So apple versus apple juice, the juice spikes you more Mm -hmm. potato versus potato chip. The chip spikes you more Um, Mm -hmm. mango versus dried mango. The mango dried mango spikes you more. So we're having our foods, our carbohydrates from whole food sources. We're not having them by themselves. We're having them at the end of a meal. And then we're utilizing our muscles move after meals. We're utilizing our muscles to use the energy that you just took in. So I Mm -hmm. think for a lot of people, the, the fact is, is that they're not necessarily moving enough to warrant having as many carbs as they're having. Like we had to go out and search for food. Like we were on a hunt all day. We're foraging, like we're utilizing things. Like Mm -hmm. I sit a lot. (laughs) I Mm -hmm. wish I didn't, I need a Mm -hmm. treadmill desk. You know, I I'm working on changing Mm -hmm. that, but I don't need that many carbohydrates. I I can't have that many because I sit a lot. When I go to the gym, if I'm doing sprints and like lifting, Mm -hmm. it's like, cool, get to have more carbs Mm -hmm. today. It just Mm -hmm. makes sense. It's not a punishment. I didn't earn it like ethically. I'm not a better person because I worked out. I'm just talking about matching (laughs) my physiology to my intake. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Cause yeah. you've got those storage tanks, your, your, your muscles and your liver, and you're just, they're emptying very slowly. So they're mm-hmm. full of this carbohydrate, essentially they're full of glycogen and they're empty. If you're not moving very much, they're emptying very slowly. So you just, it's like, yeah, if you're going to go out and crank out a huge right back out. weightlifting workout, what like you're going to dump more out and make more room. And so that's what we mean, you know, and nutrition, when we say like, earn your carbs, it's not like you're a more worthy person of carbs. We just mean like, you just don't have room for them. It's just going to more likely to go to body fat. Cause you just haven't used up your stores. That's all. Yes. Um, okay. Let's see. So, uh, digestion, that's the last thing I wanted to hit. Mm. Yeah. Cause you're really big on the, on the blood sugar management and the digestion and helping people optimize their digestion when they shift into these low carb diets. Can you share any nuggets of wisdom for people on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where a lot of people don't realize they get stuck where it's like, okay, I'm trying to lower my carbs, but when I eat fat, I have to like run to the bathroom or I yeah. get super constipated. We're going to talk about poop people. So strap in. Um, <laughs> so there's so many signs of, um, poor digestion and gut health. And a lot of people realize that, you know, gut health is important and they jump right to the gut. So they're like probiotics and, and Mm -hmm. like maybe some glutamine, like maybe they know Mm -hmm. that, but, but we have to think about the fact that digestion is this North to South process. So anything that happens up North that gets disrupted is going to affect the whole chain going down. Mm -hmm. So one of the things crash course, we have to be in a rest and digest parasympathetic nervous system state in order for our body to start the process of digestion, to pump us with stomach acid and saliva and Mm -hmm. peristalsis, moving the intestines, moving things through the intestines. Mm -hmm. So if we're on the go, we're rushing around all the time, we are, or eating distracted, eating, standing up in the kitchen over the sink, like a rat, like I have been known to do. Um, (laughs) that's a quote from friends. Um, but like (laughs) rushing and like being busy and distracted while we're eating and chewing just a couple of times, we're not going to get that complete breakdown of food. We need to think we're taking like a hunk of steak and breaking it down into microscopic particles that are like a single amino acid. You can't see that with the naked eye, a single molecule of zinc. Like, so we have to break down this food so much in order Mm -hmm. to actually get the benefits of it. And so I see people trying to increase their protein, but 
They maybe don't have a taste for stomach acid. Uh, they don't have a taste for protein anymore. Um, they aren't hungry in the morning. They um, maybe feel this excessive fullness after they eat. The food feels like it sits in their stomach like a rock. Maybe mm -hmm. they're burping or bloating shortly after eating. Maybe they have mm -hmm. heartburn or indigestion, um, undigested pieces of food in their stool, chronic constipation, um, fingernails that break, anemia. These are all signs of low stomach acid, which is, well, I skipped over chewing a little bit. Um, chewing super important, 30 times per bite. So, so, so important. But then stomach acid, that's where we need it to break down the food um, and also start protein digestion. It happens a lot in the stomach because mm -hmm. the stomach acid needs to get acidic enough in order to trigger this enzyme called pepsin to start breaking down proteins. So pepsin would digest us because we're made of protein if it were active all the time. So it needs that acidity trigger to turn it on. Mm -hmm. So when we're not acidic enough, when we're drinking all these alkaline waters at, um, at our meals or like chugging water so much at our meals or like eating on the go and the body hasn't turned on the stomach acid, then we are deficient in that. And we're going to have this insufficient breakdown of the food. When we don't have the stomach acid, it doesn't trigger the pancreas to produce enzymes. Then we get even less breakdown of the food. Um, some of those enzymes trigger the gallbladder to release bile, the cholecystokinin, mm -hmm. and we don't get that triggered mm -hmm. enough or at the right time because we don't have this acid. So stomach mm -hmm. acid is actually like, I call it the linchpin of yeah, the digestive totally. tract. It has to be really working. Um, and then we, and then also like a history of a low fat diet, a plant-based diet, um, mm -hmm. even a standard American diet, eating these crappy mm -hmm. seed oils that are everywhere. Our, our bile gets sluggish and gunky and think mm -hmm. about bile like dish soap. So if you had like, like 20 year old bile, it, I mean, dish soap, it's kind of like this gunky stuff. Mm -hmm. Try washing a sink full of dishes with that. You're not going right. to get very far. Or even people who don't have a gallbladder and are just getting like a couple of drips from the liver, you can't wash a sink full of dishes and get rid of all that fat and emulsify it all. And so we need a good amount of that right. dish soap to get rid of all that fat. And so all of these things could be happening and causing digestive issues um, with, with poor fat digestion, we could see light or clay colored stools, stools that float, stools that are shiny, um, immediate urgent trips to the bathroom or the opposite constipation. So mm -hmm. those are a lot of signs of poor gallbladder function or poor fat digestion, headaches over the eyes, tension headaches in the back of the skull, dry skin, um, hormone imbalances. So you can see that this is like reaching further than just the digestive tract. And then we get to the gut, then we get to that gut lining. And so if, if the things up North are not dialed in, if we're not chewing, if we don't have enough stomach acid, we don't have the right fat digestion. By the time the food hits the small intestine, where a, over 80% of it is supposed to be absorbed as little nutrients. Right. Now we have this big hunk of steak. That's just inflaming the tissue in there. And we're getting lack of nutrient absorption. And we're setting the stage for a lot of inflammatory issues like leaky gut and food sensitivities, because now the immune system is being involved because it's mm -hmm. like, call the, call it sound the alarms. Like this big piece of steak is here. It's not supposed to be here. It's mm -hmm. supposed to be like a couple of peptides and amino acids and B vitamins. So mm -hmm. that's how the immune system gets involved. And then you start reacting to every food and all of that sets the stage for a really poor balance of bacteria in your gut. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at different strategies to help our digestion when we're increasing, especially proteins and fats, because most totally. people already are digesting carbs. Um, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, basic sit, breathe, chew. That's what I say. So sit down. I always say, sit your mm -hmm. fine ass down at a table. This is what I struggle with. Um, breathe. So we want to get into that parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. So a couple of deep breaths, good intentions, prayer, like mm -hmm. gratitude over your food, your water. Um, this stuff is really powerful. Um, but it also drops us into this mm -hmm. parasympathetic, um, eating meals, like get rid of distractions and then chew, chew your food mm -hmm. 30 times per bite. That alone will transform your digestion. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, quick tip, apple cider vinegar before mm -hmm. meals helps to not only increase stomach acid, but also lowers the blood sugar response from yeah. meals. So 
I feel like I should be sponsored by <laughs> apple cider vinegar. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, and one quick misconception is most people think, well, I have heartburn or acid reflux. Mm -hmm. I have too much acid and 99 times out of a hundred, it's actually from too little acid. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you need more acid in the system, but you also need to work with someone because you may need mm -hmm. to heal this tissue mm -hmm. before you go dumping more acid mm -hmm. or vinegar into your system. So that's hundred percent. Yeah. I love you're doing such important work with the blood sugar and the digestion. I mean, it's like the big hitters. They are such big hitters. And, um, it's so cool because you've been through it yourself and you're obviously very dedicated to your practice and, you know, constantly learning and being open-minded. And that's why I appreciate you <laughs> and wanted to have <laughs> you come you. talk to my people. So thank you for taking the time. And then, um, her website guys is Danielle Hamilton health, um, dot com. And like you, cause you do consults and you have courses. Is that basically how people can work with you? Yes, I do still offer some one-on-ones, um, okay. but my program blood sugar mastery is my coaching program. So I coach people through all this. There's a okay. digestion module is module number two, because it's that important. Um, yeah. so we work through all of this. Um, I do have a standalone digestion course coming out soon called optimize your digestion for nice. low carb diets. And then, um, yeah. And then I work with people one-on-one -on -one and I have a podcast, unlock the sugar shackles that you are on. And my Instagram is Danielle Hamilton health.com. And I yeah. post a lot of infographics you, and things over there. <laughs> you guys probably already follow her, <laughs> but in case you aren't, make sure you do. Cause yeah, you push so much great information and I just appreciate your open mindedness and dedication to what you're doing and just, just who you are. So thank you. Right back yeah. at you, Tara. Thank you so much. <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs>